And welcome everyone to our session this morning on content creation and file management in Canvas. Uh, this session is sort of the, uh, the, the first intermediate session after, uh, after our basic introduction Canvas, where we try to show you a broad overview of Canvas without much detail, <laughs> unfortunately, in the two hours we have. This session concentrates on the beginning process of building your online course in Canvas. Uh, it focuses on uh, creating, course, uh, creating or uploading course content to Canvas. Things like lecture notes, your syllabus, uh, PowerPoint presentations, um, reading assignments outside the textbook or inside the textbook for that matter. Uh, the creation of the basic course structure and course content. Uh, we don't talk a whole lot about assessments, for instance, in this session, uh, quizzing and uh, homework assignments and things like that. That's an, we go into that in detail in another session. And uh, indeed, that's we're doing that tomorrow. That's a uh, uh, kind of the, these two kind of go together. We talk about content creation today and assessment creation and management tomorrow. But today we're going to talk about the setting up the basic structure of your Canvas course and how that works, what that typically looks like, and how to load content into Canvas to share with your students, subject matter content and uh, content you know, just basic information that students need uh, in the course, like the syllabus and things like that. Um, let me go ahead and I'll spend much of the day sharing my screen, so let me go ahead and do that. And here is our outline for today. Um, we will talk, uh, we'll start talking about importing existing content, if you're lucky enough to have that. <coughs> then we'll start, uh, talk, uh, talk about the process of building a course from scratch uh, and the different types of content that you can load into Canvas and how to do that. So let's get started with that. Uh, we'll, in order to do that, we'll go to Canvas and of course, where we'll start out in Canvas is on our dashboard. You'll be provided with your course shells automatically for your live courses. The ones for summer, of course, are there. <laughs> the ones for fall will appear probably around a week before the beginning of fall term, or toward the middle of August. So what do you do in the meantime if you want to start building your Canvas course? Because you surely don't want to wait until a week before the beginning of the term to build your Canvas course. Well, what we ask that you do is request what's called what we call a development shell or a master shell for your course. And for each of the courses that you teach, like one for English 101, one for English 205, things like that and that you develop, that you build your course in the development shell, fully build it, uh, build it out, set, create assessments, add due dates, everything you need to do to get started. <clears throat> and then uh, when your live shells, the ones that you'll actually teach in, uh, become available about a week or so before the beginning of the term, you can very quickly copy your content from the development shell into the live shell. And I'll show you how to do that today as part of something else we're doing. The reason we have to ask you to do that, one, it's, it's always good to have a copy of your content that, <laughs> student, that students have never touched, <laughs> uh, that is pristine. Uh, the shell that's never had students in it, so there's no, no baggage other than just your content, your assessments and so on in the shell. But we have a special reason for insisting on doing that here because we don't dare give you the live shells before the, about a week before the beginning of the term. We learned this the hard way 
early on with Canvas. And, it, and it's not a problem with Canvas, it's a problem with PeopleSoft and the course creation process in PeopleSoft. Um, the, and we don't dare provide you with those live Canvas, with those live canvas shells until um, the uh, course creation in PeopleSoft has settled down. Otherwise, we have a situation where people start working in their live shells and they're developing their course and so on. And then bang, a change has to be made in the uh, course listing in PeopleSoft and everybody loses access to that shell. And um, we, it, at the very least, it would in, interrupt your course creation process. At worst, it can take us some days sometimes to get that content back for you so that you don't lose what you put in there. It's just not worth the hassle for anyone. So it's very easy for you to work in a development shell until the live shell is ready and should be stable. And then you can just copy the content over from the uh, development shell to the live shell. Process takes maybe two minutes of your time, less probably once you've done it a time or two. And, um, and then you're ready to go and you don't have any more development work to do in that week before the beginning of the term. Uh, it just saves you a lot of hassle in the long run. To get a development shell, you will, uh, you can go to the help button in Canvas, which is in the Canvas, um, system menu, the global access menu here that you see on the left in every Canvas screen, and click on the help button, and you'll see the Canvas faculty support hotline number, 844-612-7422. That's always available to you in Canvas. And you can call that for help with issues in Canvas, but you can also call to get development shells, and they will make them for you right away. Um, I would pick an off-peak time because they're incredibly busy right now. They've been trying to ramp up their health, their help infrastructure after everybody in the world suddenly had to teach online within two weeks back in, back in March. So um, there can be a wait. And remember, off-peak times means off-peak times on the East Coast. <laughs> That's still where the bulk of their users are. So I would, uh, I would, call them at a good time and they will make their the development shells for you yes april did you have a have a question yeah i've been muting off and on because someone's mowing the lawn outside i hear you <laughs> the first part of the summer creating my syllabi my homework i always do this before any course begins can i upload what, what i have created in word into this development shell oh yeah and i'm about to show you how to do that <laughs> oh great thank you you bet so uh, just, you can get those development shells anytime. And uh, I think our, our average wait time right now is about seven minutes on those calls. But if you call at an off time, you should get right through in most cases. And if you have trouble getting through, please let us know and we'll work, on, we'll work with you on that. Okay, so you've got your development shell. It should show up as a tile on your dashboard when you log into Canvas. Hopefully your dashboard won't look like this. <laughs> so I think I've got everything moved up here to where I can find what I need today. Uh, the, um, the process of adding content to your Canvas course can actually go very quickly. The hard part, of course, is creating the content in the first place. But chances are you've done that over the years already. If, you have, if you've taught these courses time and time again in the classroom, you probably have a lot of the content you need for your can, online Canvas course already. The things that you would typically hand out to your students in class, lecture notes, uh, reading assignments. Um, uh, of course, this, Students will also have their textbook, and you can refer them to reading assignments in the textbook through uh, Canvas. Uh, 
you can put your PowerPoint slide decks in Canvas. You can put narrated PowerPoint presentations, videos in the Canvas very easily. You can share just about any kind of content that can be put into a computer file or put online so it can be accessed through a link, through a URL. Any of that content can be provided to your students on Canvas in such a way that they can access that content at any time of the day or night on their own schedule. So-called asynchronous online learning, which is what Canvas is built for. It's the asynchronous component to distance education, to online learning, where Zoom or something like it is the synchronous component. And you'll find in fully online classes, if you haven't taken one or taught one before, is that the thing that induces students to take online classes in normal times is this flexibility, this ability to do the work on their own schedule within limits. You set due dates, for assessments and things like that. Uh, things have to be done by a certain time, but within those structures, students can pretty much perform the work at a time of their own convenience, which is a tremendous advantage to too many of them, and the thing that drives them to online courses in the first place. So you'll find this resistance, a certain degree of resistance to synchronous activities in online courses. Doesn't mean you shouldn't use them, it just means you may not get 100% attendance as you are, well, not that you're ever going to get 100% attendance in the classroom, but you may see a lower level of attendance in synchronous real-time events like this Zoom meeting we're doing today uh, in, an, in a fully online course. But with the ability to record on Zoom, you can, of course, record those sessions and put links to those into Canvas as well. So Canvas can provide students access to just about every part of your course um, asynchronously, which is what we're getting at here. Um, before I start showing you how to do this, I'd like to show you uh, just a little bit about what a Canvas course looks like in case this is all very new to you. Those of you who are working in the online faculty certification program are already seeing a good online course. But just in case, let's take a quick look. Uh, here I've got a built out course here uh, that is a fairly simple one, so it's fairly digestible in a short period of time. Uh, the core of the of any canvas course is the modules tool which is accessed through the course menu on the left with through the modules link in a blank in, in a new canvas shell this is also the default entry point for the course that is that's this is where you're dropped when you enter the course the modules tool This is typically where your students access their content. There are other ways to do this, but they're not nearly as functional and not recommended. This is the gold standard. You put content for your students that you wish them to access into modules. And modules are just collections of related content. Like this first module here, which is fairly typical in an online course, is the content that students need before they actually start interacting with your subject matter content. This is the stuff you typically take care of on the first day of class in the classroom. Things like the uh, uh, syllabus. Just, you know, a general welcome. Hi, and I'm, I'm your instructor. This is who I am. And, why I'm here, this is why I'm a credible instructor for this course and so on. Um, here we've got a discussion forum that students can use to ask questions of you without having to send you an email. There's good reasons for doing that. Um, and maybe a little quiz on the syllabus to see if anybody read it. You, give them, uh, you might even give them some credit on that. You can even set things up in Canvas so that students can take the syllabus quiz over and over, and you can stop them from moving on into the rest of your course until they've gotten a, a perfect score on the syllabus quiz. 
so that you can kind of ensure that they read the syllabus, which is something that's very hard to do in the classroom without a bullwhip and a chair, uh, which probably wouldn't fly, but this will, this, you can get away with this just fine. And then typically that's followed by a series of, of subject modules that reflect how you logically subdivide your class with each module containing links to related content and assessments and activities that are all related to some, logically related to some portion of your course. Like in this course, I've taken a series of topics and each module represents a separate topic. This was a, a, a flex course for faculty to learn to do screencasting, which, it's gotten a lot easier since Zoom came along. I mean, we're screencasting right now. We're recording this computer screen with voiceover and people can play it back and, and see this presentation just as well as if they've been here live, maybe better. Hey, Dave, I have a quick question. Which yes. is the, the numbering on this? Like, because part of the uh, certification course that you have to number things. so. So one person did the orientation, the, like get started, the first one you have up there. Right. Mm -hmm. As 0 0.1. So that it was a zero. So they're like one and 1.1 1 .1 didn't start till their content right. in their course. Yeah, and that's, that's a choice. That's Which a I style, I would call it, of creating modules. Numbering, uh, op uh, items within modules helps when uh, people have questions about that. Uh, and it's a, it's a shorthand way to say, well, I'm having trouble with uh, activity 6.1. And it makes it easier for everybody to communicate. So that's not a bad thing, but it is a stylistic choice and not a canvas requirement. Okay. Okay. Do you think um, it's good to have that orientation thing as a zero? That kind of was a little, yeah, the getting started 0 mm -hmm. 0 0.1, that was a little off-putting in a way for me. So I, I just did mine as one. Right. That, and that's entirely up to you. That, like I say, that's, that's a style thing, not a, uh, and, and it, while it's convenient in some ways, it's by no means required. Um, so this will work just as well for the students. And this was, and this course is inherently less complex than the one that you're working on right now in the training course. So it didn't seem necessary to me to do this, to do that kind of numbering. Dr. So that is, again, that's a stylistic choice, not a, a canvas requirement. Okay. Dr. Dave? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. I'm on the phone, not on the uh, laptop. Yes, I so, see. Works <laughs> great. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I try to uh, go back to the email from uh, Mary. And, uh, and I uh, click on that uh, Zoom uh, conference, but it did not work. Hmm. I just tried that. I've heard a couple of people say that, but I just tried it this morning and it worked well for me. I'm not sure what's going on there. But you obviously you found, what did you use a link, an earlier link that you had? Uh, that's the one I've been, uh, I used, but uh, it did not work in my uh, laptop. But uh, for some reason, I don't know how I got to this, to the phone mm -hmm. and I, I saw you. So I, I don't know. Um, I can, mean, why, why nothing? We'll look, in, we'll look into that. Uh, right now, I want to make sure we get through the section on content creation. But Thank you. We'll look into that. I did, I, I did just test that link, though, in the email that she sent, and it did work. So I'm not sure what's happening there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so typically, you have a series of modules. Each module may represent a different topic or a different week in the course, or a different chapter in the text, 
however you logically organize your course material when you present it in class, you, could, you would use that logical organization to guide your creation of modules. But each module should have all the links in it that a student needs, a link to everything that they need, your course content that you're providing to them, which is what we're talking about adding in today, but also your links to things like assessments, so quizzes, homework assignments, graded discussions, and uh, anything that the student needs should be in the modules. Ideally, in a Canvas course, the student should very rarely, if ever, have to go over here and work in the course menu. They shouldn't have to go over to the assignments tool, say, to find a quiz or a homework assignment. There should be a link to it in a module somewhere that they can access it from. Indeed, some people hide almost all of these um, links in the course menu from students, as you've seen I've done here and force them to access the content and the assessments, everything they need through the modules. This ensures that they see the, at least see the content and the assessments presented in a logical order and in context, rather than just uh, accessing the assignments outside the, uh, uh, outside of the modules. So ideally, a student, if, a, if a, the, everything is in your modules and your modules are organized logically, a student can start at the top of the first module and work their way down sequentially and just keep working until they get to the bottom of the last module. And when they get to the bottom of the last module, they should be done with the course. So there should never be any doubt in their minds where to start or what to do next, because those kind of doubts will drive a student wild faster than anything. Uh, many uh, students, particularly students who are accessing an online course for the first time, if there's any question about what to do and when to do it, it's gonna freak them out. And they're gonna be a real high risk for attrition in the course. So this logical organization of modules in a Canvas course is critical. We call this modular course design, and it's the gold standard for course design in an online course. We find this to be far better than just, say, creating a module that has all of your, uh, all of your PowerPoint presentations in it, and another module that has all your reading assignments in it, and things like that. It's much better and much more uh, logical for the students if the each module contains everything that the student needs. Dave? Just one type of content. Yes. Dave? Hey, all, right. all right, so does that mean everything is published? But is there a way that they, like, they can see that there's going to be a lecture, but you don't want them to see it yet? That's the part I'm not oh, sure. sure. Right. The accessibility to students uh, is another issue, of course, within modules. Okay. Uh, you can not publish a module until you're ready. Remember, publishing Canvas means make it visible to students. So I can take, I can make topic one unavailable to students simply by unpublishing it. And that, un and that makes everything in this module invisible. I can do that manually, or at the top of each module, I have the option to edit that module going, I just go to the context menu for the module as a whole, these little dots here, and I click on that, and I can edit that module. That allows me to edit the name, but it also allows me to um, decide when the students can see that module. I, so I can control access by date and time. Okay. I don't want students to see a module until a certain date and time. I can just select that. I can also add prerequisites and requirements. 
like I can set it up so that a student can't see topic one until they've taken the syllabus quiz and, and submitted it. So, and there are other details you can go into there. Okay, so like they can see that there's going to be a quiz, but they just can't access it unless you put right. a, a in there. Because that was something I, I kind of had a problem where students said, oh, I didn't see that, and it wasn't published or the date. Right, right. And if something's not published, the students won't see it at all. Yeah, but if you want them to know there's going to be a quiz, but you just don't want them to access, you have to put a due date. Because I saw uh, some. Yeah, you can, you can uh, for instance, with the... Uh, with this second module, I could do something like adding a prerequisite. I can select the getting started module and they have to finish the getting started module until they, before they can start the next one. I can requirements. Um, the students can, uh, I don't necessarily want them to have to move through in sequential order, but um, I can, let's see, I don't think I ever saw the prerequisites or requisites before. Yeah, th those are always there. Okay. And you can set a, a prerequisite to finish the getting started module, but you can also add a requirement that students complete the, and actually I need to do that in the previous one, excuse me, that before students can be um, considered to have completed the getting started module, you can set a requirement that a student must take the syllabus quiz and submit it. You can even set it, you can set a minimum score they have to make before they can move out of this module. So those are all options you have to control a student's progress through the course. <clears throat> but certainly you, the easiest thing for you to do is just manually publish the next module when it's ready. If you're not certain about when you'll be ready for that, you can just keep your modules unpublished and publish them at a time of your own choosing. And if the module is unpublished, the students can't see anything inside it. Okay, thank you. Did that answer your question? Yes. Very good. Dave, I have a quick question, which is the only place yes. you can add a prerequisite or requirement is on the top module thing? Is, is on the module, yes. And that's a good question, yes. Mm -hmm. I can't set prerequisites on individual uh, items within the module, only on the module as a whole. All right, thank you. That's something, quite frankly, I'd like to see possible in Canvas, but they've chosen not to do that yet. For one thing, that would make Canvas more complex to use. Uh, particularly for new faculty, or faculty coming to this new. And uh, Canvas's ethos is that Canvas should be easy to use, above all. They'll sometimes eschew a bit of power in the interface in order to keep it simple. And it's a difference in philosophy between Blackboard and Canvas, for instance. Blackboard is, has options like you just described where you can set an individual item within a module to be available or not available based upon certain dates and times and things like that or or other factors within the course but that makes blackboard a lot more complex to use uh, and even doing simple things in blackboard can be quite challenging and that's that's their that's blackboard's philosophy Whereas Canvas tries to keep things simple for both you and especially for your students. And to witness the fact that Black, uh, Canvas is basically eating Blackboard's lunch most of the way around the country right now that tells you which philosophy is proven to be more uh, effective 
uh, in the view of most uh, online educators. Well, At least know, those in California, <laughs> in the California community colleges. <laughs> yeah, but isn't it also because Canvas is free and hard to beat that? Oh, Canvas is not free. Oh, I heard that they offered it to Canvas. The Canvas does not, the schools do not pay for Canvas. That's right. Directly out of their budgets. But the state chancellor's office is very definitely paying for Canvas. And that money otherwise might have come to our budgets. So there's no free lunch. Canvas, in fact, Canvas costs more than Blackboard was costing us in real terms. Uh, but it has significant advantages or it was judged to at the time this decision was made okay. so but it's not free <laughs> ain't no free lunch i'm afraid all right uh so this is kind of what a canvas course looks like particularly to a student is a series of modules so now we want to talk about how we can get this content into a canvas shell that's the focus of our session today. So let me jump back to my dashboard here and find a nice blank shell, just like the ones that you're going to be dealing with. And that, I believe that one was, I hope I can find it again. Oh, do, 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 content creation, content creation. Where do they do that? Uh oh. One of the reasons for cleaning up your your uh, dashboard. I know I just fixed that. Should have dragged that up there in just a second. Sorry about that. I believe that's the one. Nope. But I can make it the one real quick. This is a feature we've reactivated for you just recently. You can go to your settings in a Canvas course and reset it, which deletes everything in the course. You, that's useful if you're like resetting your development shell because you want to start over in it. It's not something you'd ever do in a live course, we hope. Because if you do, you lose everything that's in there and we can't get it back. So, but here is a, here's what a blank canvas course looks like. And this is what you'll see when you get your live shell. So this is what you'll see when you get your development shell initially, nothing there. So how do we add content to the canvas shell? Well, there's basically two ways you can go. One, if you're lucky enough to already have some content in another Canvas course or in another learning management system somewhere, or if you have a colleague who um, teaches online or ha at least has some content in a Canvas shell that they'd be willing to share with you, and a surprising number of your colleagues have been willing to do that over the years, um, then you can pull that existing content into Canvas and at least have a starting point on developing your Canvas course. That's a wonderful thing to be able to do. Should you be that lucky? And, and indeed, some departments have generic starter shells for some of their more commonly offered courses. So you might check with your department head or your dean or with some of your colleagues that you know teach the same course and see if they have content that they'd be willing to share. If they do, all you have to do is go to the settings link in your course menu in Canvas, which takes you uh, to your settings pages. You wanna be in the course details tab. Actually, it doesn't matter if you're doing this. Normally that's where you'll drop. Uh, but there's an option to import course content in the task menu over here on the right. If you click on that, um, 
depending on what form the content is in, you select the content type that you want to import. If it's from a course, if, if it's from an earlier course of yours, you just select, that's on this system, you just select copy a Canvas course. Then you search for the course name. My keyword, I'll just pick that one. You select the course you want to copy from. You can copy either all content or some of the content from that shell. And then you just click import and the process runs and the content shows up in your, in this current shell. This is what you will do when you're copying content from your development shell into your live shell. You just go say copy a canvas course, find your search for your development shell by keyword, take all the content and click import. Takes 30 seconds at the outside. Then you wait for the copy to finish. That may take a little longer if it's a big course, usually not more than five minutes or so. And you're done. So that's not a big deal. But if a colleague has a course that they're willing to share to, with you, they can provide you with what's called a Canvas course export package, which is just a backup of their course. It's a zip file. You just select that option and then you look for that file by hitting the choose file button and look for it on wherever you've stored it on your local hard drive. I have some, uh, let's see, I think I've got some, yeah, Canvas course exports. Files look something like this. You just select the one you want and click open. Then again, you can choose to import all or some content from that. And if you decide to support, import some content, you can pick exactly what you want to import, but usually you'll import all of it and just throw away what you don't want. And then you just click import and the process runs. That's if you got a, got something from a colleague or maybe from a publisher who had a basic canvas shell that they would share with you. Some publisher, uh, some textbooks come with canvas, basic canvas shells, particularly some, um, open educational or open textbooks. Uh, there's a company called, uh, uh, oh, gee. <laughs> uh, there, there are <laughs> companies that provide open textbooks that have canvas shells that come with them that you can at least start your course from. Khan Academy. Uh, Khan Academy has content like that, indeed. So, um, I'll think of that, uh, OpenStax, that's the company. Uh, OpenStax has worked with the California Community College's Online Education Initiative to um, produce basic Canvas shells that go with their open textbooks that you can download and use for free. Uh, let's see, let me make sure I can find this course again, content creation. Um, I hate to jump out of that one right now. Let me go and bring up another another window here, browser window. And log in to Canvas from another browser. Dave? You can go. You you should have access. Yes. I'm sorry. Do, um, do you know any OER? Uh, companies that work that have English as a second language open text. Uh, that's a good question. I have um, several times and I'm like, couldn't find I'm going to show you, let me show you where to look. Um, I would hope most of you at least should have this um, tile on your desktop already for our open educational resources site here at the district. If you don't have that, I'd appreciate it if you'd email me and I'll put you in there so you have access to it. We try to put people in periodically in groups, but I'm always happy to put people in individually. This course has a 
variety of open free resources yeah. that you can use for your online courses and also open textbooks and we have them broken out by subject and i believe oh let's see where was that uh, education we we have some i thought i had some language books in here i'm not going to spend a lot of time on this right now looking but here's open stacks mm -hmm. which you can go and those they those textbooks are fan, are great they're available for free in electronic form students can pay for them pay a modest cost for them, having them printed if they want to want that and the cartridge of the canvas cartridges are available to you for free to start your canvas course uh, and I'm going to, then those can also be found in the Canvas Commons, which I'm going to show you here in a minute. But these are open textbook libraries available all over the world. Starting probably, I'd start with the open textbook library. Chances are pretty good you can find some ESL content in there. Okay. And each one of these might have some of that. So this is a good place to go and get started looking for open educational resources for ESL. But another place you can go is right inside Canvas. Uh, you can also, I'm gonna cancel out of this, I don't wanna actually import any of that into this shell because we're gonna build it out from scratch here in a second. But you can go to the Canvas Commons, which is always available in your Canvas Global Access menu here. And that is a huge, learning objects repository available with all this contents available to you for free uh, to use sometimes you have to attribute it before you use it but that's about the worst you'll have to do it's perfectly legal it's been put in here by people who went meant to share it and you're welcome to share your own content this way and this content ranges from uh, individual modules like we were talking about in the previous course to down to homework assignments discussions uh, canvas pages we'll talk about what those are in a minute uh, quizzes all the way up to full-blown courses there are tons and tons of can pre-built canvas courses that you can import right into your into your development shell and keep what you like and throw away what you don't. The, um, oh, I just noticed something here, excuse me. Something about Are those out of. icons? Uh, like, yes. Oh, so is there something that explains what those different codes are or they just come up automatically? Uh, the, um, it looks like there's blue for the textbooks and something a different. Yeah, it, each one is each one is labeled. Okay. Um, uh, as a module, assignment, document, or full blown course. They ran out of colors apparently. <laughs> the okay. blue is used for documents and for full full blown courses, and um, you can search this repository by subject oh, okay. oh yeah i didn't misspell english oh it wants it capped okay <laughs> oh my gosh yeah here's beginner esl grades four to eight uh, conversational English. There are no less than what 29 results here. Oh, in ESL. And it's all ESL. And if you find one that looks useful, you can import the whole thing, like this conversation on oh, third grade. That, may not be especially useful for us, but you may find stuff in it that's useful. 
No, that would be good because when I looked here before, they were all like higher level because I teach like a low level. Level three, four in ESL is like a grade two or something, grade three. Wow. Yeah. So, okay. So maybe this course might be interesting. Yeah. So you can, you can look at it by yeah. clicking on the link to it and you can see, you get a little preview of it. Mm. You can get details about it. And if it looks interesting, I mean, there's no, no risk to downloading it and putting it into your development shell because if you don't like it, you can just reset the development shell and blow it away and start right. again. Okay, great. So to, to, and to put it into your shell is just easy. You've got this import slash download button over here on the right. Mm -hmm. You just click that and then you click the course that you want to put this into. Mm -hmm. And you can put it into multiples at the same time, if you like. And then down at the bottom, there's an import into course button. Okay. And you just click that and five or 10 minutes later, the content will be in there. And okay. you, like I say, you can use what you like, throw away what you delete, what you don't or delete. If it's turns out not to be useful at all, you can just reset your development shell and start again. Okay, great. Thank so, you don't necessarily have to start from dead zero on this. So, but even if you don't start from nothing, at some point you're going to have to add a lot of your content into the course manually or from scratch. So now we're going to spend the rest of the day talking about how you do that. And it turns out it's not very complicated. The hard part is having the content to put into Canvas. And that's something you've been developing your entire career and may need to develop more for an online course because things that you say in lecture, um, you may not have in the form of a document or a file or something like that. Though, of course, you can record your lectures using Zoom, just like we're doing right now, and you can put links to those lectures into Canvas. And we'll see how to do that. So it's just, uh, there's nothing that you, no form of content that I can imagine that you can't put into Canvas. The, um, to get started, of course, you have to have modules because modules are the fundamental structure, provide the fundamental structure of a Canvas course. So what this big kind of pointless link here on the, in, the, uh, in your Canvas, blank Canvas course, allows you to do is create your first module. You can click on that link and create the module, or you can just go up here since, since this course is automatically uh, set to drop you into the modules tool. See, that's where we are in the, in the uh, navigation breadcrumbs here. We're in the modules tool. When we get this blank, open up this blank course, we can just add a module up here too. This is just kind of window dressing, but I'll click on it. And that brings us to our screen where we can add a module to our course. So this would be our first module. And typically this module will be something that contains links to content that the students need before they start working with your course content, your actual subject matter content, though that's a stylistic thing. You might choose to organize your content differently, but I'm just going to start this as a getting started module, or you could call it introduction or welcome or hi there. You can call it Fred if you want to. And then I just add the module and I get my first blank module. Now the question becomes, how do I add content to that module? And the immediate answer to that is this plus sign right here. Um, in the 
same on the same in this box that shows the name of the module that you just created, there are three little icons. One is a publish unpublish button that allows you to determine whether students can see this or not. If the check mark is there, it's published. If it's not, it's not. And students can't see it. You have a context menu, three vertical dots, that allows you to do things like move the module around, edit it, you can change the name, delete it, if you decided it was a bad idea, duplicate it. If several modules are very similar to one another, you may want to duplicate them so that you have the same structure and so on. You can share a module to the commons. That's where a lot of those modules that you saw in the commons came from and so on. But what you really need right now is a way to add content to this module. And that's this add, add sign, this uh, plus sign. So if we click on that plus sign, we see what we can add to the module. It says add item to module or to get a, the getting started module. What do they mean by items? Well, I mean one of these things in this course, in this menu here. And these are just roughly arranged in order of how frequently they're used. Actually, it looks like they started out in alphabetical order and then just went randomly, I don't know. But you can add a homework assignment. We're not talking so much about assessments today, but that's something you can, you can add, you can create a homework assignment and add a link to the assignment to the module. Same with a quiz. But what we're talking about today is course content. And that would include files, pages, and external URLs, which are just web links, links to content out on the web, not part of Canvas. <clears throat> so, like if you were teaching a, uh, a business course, you might link out to the Wall Street Journal website or something like that. So, but more often than not, it's gonna be files and pages. And that's what we're going to talk about now. What's the difference? How do you add them? Well, a file is a computer file that you have probably already have on your local computer. This would be something like your syllabus in a Word file or a PowerPoint presentation in a PowerPoint file or a PDF document. Uh, it might be a a supplemental reading that you have in Word or PDF form on your local computer. It might be lecture notes that you've typed out for yourself that you share with your students. This gives you a very easy way. You know, so I know some people keep voluminous lecture notes and it's, <clears throat> it's difficult to convince repro to run those off, you know, 20 pages of lecture notes for a, for a chapter that you've created over the years. Uh, you know, running those off on paper and handing them to students is kind of costly, time consuming, resource intensive, and the students are liable to lose them anyway. But if you're doing this online, you can just drop those lecture notes right into Canvas and the students can view them without having to print them out and they can't lose them. <laughs> so all of those things are examples of files that you might want to upload to Canvas. And there are a gajillion other types of files that you might share with your students. And Canvas makes it very easy to do that. So let's work through that process first, and then we'll come back and talk about Canvas pages because files are really simple. Assuming you have the file created. <laughs> okay, that's not simple, I know. That takes years of your life. But you've got the many, you've probably got a lot of these files ready to go. How do you put them into Canvas and share them with your students? Well, you just select file from the get, uh, this um, add item dialog box here. And then you tell Canvas, this is a new file. I haven't uploaded. By new file, it just mean, uh, that just means uh, I haven't uploaded this to Canvas already. If you've already uploaded it to Canvas, you'll find it listed down here in this box. But 
we're starting from scratch. So this is gonna be a new file. So you just click on that file or on that new, the words new file and a choose files button pops up. You click on that and you can then find the files that you wanna uh, upload to Canvas. I have some here somewhere. There we go. Finding them may be the challenge <laughs> if you're like me and your hard drive's in the mess that mine's in. But here, for instance, is a syllabus. That's something that I might put in a getting started module. I'll select that file. It's a Word document that I've already created. I just select it and click open. And that tells Canvas which file I want to put into this module. And I then just click add item. Canvas uploads, uh, that uploads the file to Canvas. The file actually lives in your file manager over here in the course menu. If I click on that, I can see that file. This is like File Explorer in Windows or the Finder in the Mac for Canvas. This is just a list of your files that you've uploaded to Canvas, but you don't even need to worry about that. Uh, if you don't want to, we can just go to the modules, back to the module, and, whoa, I apparently didn't finish that process. Oops, yeah, I did. There we go. Uh, and it, it had just minimized itself for some reason. There's the there's that file, or at least a link to that file. If that is published, and if the module is published, a student can come in and just click on that link. And very quickly, that file will be visible to the students. This is what's called a server-side viewer. That file didn't actually download to my local computer and open up there, as used to be the case in Blackboard, for instance. That file's still on Canvas, and Canvas opened up a version of it in this viewer very quickly so that students can read it. So first off, it, didn't, it doesn't matter whether the student has Word or some Word viewer on their local computer or on their smartphone or whatever they're viewing the course in. Canvas will show them the file without having to worry about that. That was a major problem in Blackboard. Uh, like you might post a Word document and a student might not have Word or any kind of way to view a Word file on their computer. And they would have a hard time accessing that content. You don't have to worry about that in Canvas, at least for common file types, like Word documents. Excel spreadsheets, uh, the Microsoft Office documents in general are not a problem. PowerPoint files, PDF files are shown in viewers like this, um, and, a, and a variety of others. So you don't have to worry about students can, whether students can open this file or not. If the file type is an unusual file type, like say an AutoCAD drawing or something like that, then, then in that event, the student would have to actually download the file. And Canvas would know that and would automatically send the file down to the student's computer where the student would have to have an application that could open that file. But for common content types like Word documents and things like that, you don't have to worry about that. The student can download the file though if they want to. The main reason they might do that is if they wanted to print it on paper. They can always download the document by clicking on this link at the top of the, uh, of the page here, and then they can save it to their local hard drive, and then they can do what they will with it. That's something to think about, of course. If you put content in a Word document, somebody, your students can download it, and edit it, and do whatever they want with it. So, Dave, I that's, I that's one disinclination to do that. Yes. I thought, is Docs a Word document? If this is Doc X, is that Word? Yeah. That's so Word. If they don't have the Word program. Doesn't matter. 
they can still print it, download it, and print it? No. They, in order to print it, they'd have to have Word or some Word. Actually, 99% of computers, PCs, and Macs have a, an application that will at least allow them to view and print a Word document. So that's not a big deal with a Word document. It's a little bit more of a big deal with PowerPoint, but not with Word. But they would be able to view it regardless of the state of their computer and what they had on the computer, because this happens on Canvas. This viewer here happens on Canvas. So they can read it on here at the very least. And it never has to hit paper. So that's how files, uploading files to Canvas works. Uh, there's uh, not much to that in adding files to your module. Let's do that again, just to be comfortable with it. We'll add something to the module. We'll select a file. I'll add a new file, I'll upload a new file. I'll choose the file or files. I can actually upload multiple files at a time, which is handy. Um, those are probably not appropriate for this. Let's see. Here's a, um, let's see, find something here. Oh, there we go. There's a, a, a web page. You can load web pages on the Canvas. Canvas is basically a web server. That's a, got some information in it that students would need in this course before they get started with the actual topics. I can just select that file, click open, and add the item. And there it is, it appears. If you don't like these file extensions appearing, that kind of makes it look a little geeky. You can edit the mm -hmm. individual file item by clicking on the context menu, selecting edit, and you can eliminate that file extension if that offends you. <laughs> but it works the same either way. Student just click on that and that wasn't much of a file, but there was something there. Oops, <laughs> it's like I goofed something here. I, I didn't get a, I didn't bring a graphic over. My bad, not the canvases. Hey, can I ask you a quick question? Of course. Um, can you, if you have like Word documents or something like that, and mm -hmm. you want to put them in here, can you put them in so that they can't download them? They can only view them? Uh, no. But what you can do is convert your Word documents to PDFs. Right. You can do that right within Word. And then they can download it, but they can't do anything with it. Unless they have they an can't, Adobe. Or, right. They can't edit it or anything like that. Well, even if they have Adobe Acrobat, it's difficult to do significant editing of a PDF file. Okay. Uh, that's, it's more trouble than they would ever want to go to. Yeah, so you do have that option. But, but anything that you put into Canvas as a file, they can download. But there is an alternative to that that I'm going to show you right now. Yes. Yeah, you set the settings so that they can't print, but I mean, a really smart student can do it, but it's like the top 15%, but there is a setting in PDF, Adobe. Right, yes, yes, you can lock your PDF documents so they can't be printed and they can't be edited. And add a lot of color, that way it costs them a lot of money if they do figure it out. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. And then they run out of a lot of ink, if you put a lot of reds and blues in and, they you can you can seriously uh, impede their options. So indeed, that a PDF file is a much more um, secure type of document. So Dave, I can access Dropbox and grab a document from Dropbox. You can. Oh, okay. You can. Typically what you would do with Dropbox is um, 
download the file to your local computer and then upload it to Canvas. Canvas does have integrations with Dropbox that can um, smooth that process, but it's generally easier. If you've got a file on Dropbox that you want to use, that you want to put into a module in Canvas, it's probably easier just to download it to your local computer and then upload it using this process. Okay. When students go to submit assignments though, and they want to upload files from Dropbox, or I'm sorry, not from Dropbox, but from Google Docs, they can do that automatically without having to download it to their local computer first. And we can do that also. Yeah, and you can do that also. Okay, so we've got a couple of files in here. Great. Um, and we can just keep doing that. However many files you have, you can load right into your modules very quickly. Bing, 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 bing. Doesn't take time at all. Indeed, you can, you can select multiple files to download at one time and just build out the module all in one operation. So adding files to Canvas is really easy and quick. Dave, is the, it easy to move them around or do you have to put them in the correct order to begin with? <laughs> you do not have to put them in the correct order to begin with. You can move items within modules just by clicking and dragging them up and down using these little movement tools here on the left, the two uh, vertical rows of four dots. And you just Easy. click and drag. Thank you. I'm glad I asked. Thanks. That makes, <laughs> that makes life easier. Yeah, we were going to mention that <laughs> at some point. <laughs> And you can, if you have multiple modules, you can drag them around too. If you decide, well, you know, this topic should come before that one, and I've changed my mind, you can move the modules the same way so that you have full control over the order in which content is provided to students. And, and at it really some doesn't point, matter will you, what order you upload them in. Mm -hmm. At some point, will you share with us if I've made a module, but I, I later decide I want to add another item. I want to know yes. how to do that. All you have to do is click this plus sign at any time. The plus sign at the top of the module here will allow you to add content to the module whenever. When you're first building the course, or if, this, if you come across something that would be useful later on, you can always add content to a module at any time using this same process that we're going through right now. Thanks. You bet. Good question. Um, so files are an important type of content that you'll share with your students through Canvas, but they're not by no means the only type of content. Maybe even more common and more important are the Canvas pages, which is the other major content type that you can add to, can to a Canvas module, a page. A page is a file, but it's a file that you create on Canvas rather than creating it offline and uploading it to Canvas. It's, it's called a page because it's basically a web page, which you know, all content on the World Wide Web is contained in web pages. And you can create web pages inside Canvas, Canvas pages, that contain your content. Uh, to create a page in Canvas, you can just select, you know, hit that plus sign on your module. There are other ways to create pages in Canvas too, but this is probably the most straightforward overall. You just add a, an item to your module, you select page to add, and you say new page. You click new page, and Canvas asks you to name the page. And in this, in this getting started module, I might like a welcome page. So I'll just call this welcome. But I, I, it can be anything. You can name it anything. It can, be, it can contain anything. We'll see the different types of content you can put into a page here. 
So I name the page and I add the item. And I get a link to a page. Gee, that was easy. <laughs> But, you know, there's a catch here. There's nothing in that page right now. It's just a blank page. It's that dreaded blank white sheet of paper. <laughs> so now, our, now the work begins. We can add, we can develop that page. We can put stuff into that page by clicking on the name of the page in the module. You can also access your pages through the pages tool in the course menu, if you like. You can go over there and there's that welcome page. It's just as blank here as it was there. You get to the same place either way. And I've got this blank page. All I've got is the name. So to add content to it, of course, I'll, I'll just click edit, the edit button. And I bring up, what we'll spend most of the rest of our time talking about today, the rich content editor. It's called the RCE in Canvas. This is Canvas's text editor, though it's a lot more than just that. It's really a like a little mini Microsoft Word, or more appropriately, maybe a mini um, uh, web editor. It allows you to create web pages but it operates a lot like Word. It's just not as complicated or as powerful. But within the limitations of web pages of the, of the hypertext markup language, HTML, in which web pages are created, it's quite powerful. Um, you can, of course, add text just by typing uh, is the first thing you might do, making a, a page. I might call this, uh, put a little, banner or a little title here welcome to and this was an introduction to screen casting course but you would obviously put your subject the name of your course there okay so i can type into a canvas page i can also paste into a canvas page if you have text in a word document or something like that you can just paste it right in here and Flash, news flash for those of you who used to use Blackboard, it's safe to do so in Canvas. You took your life in your hands pasting from Word into the, the comparable editor in Blackboard because it, it could literally destroy your course, at least temporarily, if you did that sometimes. Blackboard was very uh, vulnerable <laughs> to material that came over from Word documents. Canvas doesn't seem to be. So you could, if you have something typed in a Word document, you could paste it right into here safely. You might lose some formatting, but you can handle that on the back end. Um, but if you type something in, you have all the usual text editing tools here on the top line of the Rich Content Editor's control icons. You can bold this. I'm gonna italicize it. I'll spare you underlining it. <laughs> Um, you can change the text color and you can change the background color, basic word kind of stuff. You can change the size of the typeface, make it bigger, smaller. What you can't do in a web editor is set the typeface, the font. That's going to be chosen for you and even if you set it here, you couldn't de depend upon it translating onto the student's computer when they view it as the same typeface. That's just a limitation of the hypertext markup language that's used to generate web pages, the HTML, so-called, which you don't have to worry about. But the, a consequence of that is you can't control the typeface. It will be something readable. That's about all you can depend on. Um, at least you can't control it in this editor. Yes, April. Yeah. Um, is there information on how to access accents? Um, for instance, on my own computer, I can have shortcuts and type them in. Is it different here? For instance, accents are different when I do PowerPoint. I have to right. Go so uh, diacritical marks and uh, 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 foreign language accents and things like that. Yes. You. This is pretty compatible with that. It'll handle any standard text character, pretty much. So you should, 
I haven't tried that a lot, but you should probably be fine with those same shortcuts that you use in Word. Good question. Um, I can also center this or write justify it. I don't have a full justify option here, but I can center left or right anyway. I can put in superscripts and subscripts if I'm doing mathematical type stuff. I can create bulleted lists and numbered lists just as I can in Word. So this is just a fairly simple basic text editor for starters. But it's a lot more than that. The second line of the rich content editor is why it's called the rich content editor. <laughs> because you can add all sorts of media to pages like this. You can add still images, pictures. You can add an embed video. You can add hyperlinks, links to content outside of Canvas. You have a, an equation editor. It's not a great equation editor, but you have an equation editor that you can use to put mathematical notation in. You can pull links to stuff right out of the commons. And you can use other ex external tools, like you can pull video right from 3C Media, which is the, um, the video, object, video learning objects repository maintained by the California Community Colleges, shared content. You can pull stuff from Vimeo. You can pull, pull content from your Google Docs right into here. And you can pull content from YouTube or video from YouTube directly. You can even record your own video right here. I click that. Um, it's going to have trouble with that because I've got several cameras associated with this. So I'm, I think I'm going to chew that right now because Zoom is using my camera, so it's a little troublesome. But you can do uh, recordings right here. Don't necessarily recommend it, but you can do it. For one thing, these recordings are not captionable in practical terms. So it has to be something that's really trivial uh, that uh, your students don't have to access. We'll see other ways to do things like that here. So um, you've got all these different sorts of things you can put in. Let's put in a still image as an, as an example. I just lowered that uh, uh, title down in the usual way by just pressing the enter key on the keyboard. And here I've got a, a space above it to put something into. Um, I can put still images in using this tool right here, the embed image tool. If you've got a little digital camera, the chances are you've seen that icon before. It's standard icon for a photograph. If we click on that, we can pull images into this, uh, doc this page, this Canvas page that we're uh, writing. Normally, you would pull them from Canvas itself. The first option, I've never understood why it's the first option, is to just pull a photo right off the web. If you go out on a web page and find a picture you like, you can right click on it and you can get the URL for that picture, the link, the web link for that picture, and you can paste it in here and then Canvas will go and pull that right out of that web page and drop it right into your page. The problem being, if anybody ever moves or deletes that photo from the web, your photo just goes blank. So I mean, it's not the best way to do things. But you, if you, you can, take an image that you have on your local computer by and put it into this document by selecting the Canvas tab here. 
you tell can you have to tell Canvas where you want to store this picture. This is going to go into your file manager and it's going to count against your file allocation in Canvas. Uh, so you have to put it either in your course files or your personal file space on Canvas. Usually you'll put it into the course files. So you just click that and then Canvas gives you a button to upload the file right here. So you click on that button and it pops up a, a file explorer or a finder window and you go and you look for that picture that you want to upload. And I've got too many pictures here, but I think I can find this one. I just, yeah, I just want this uh, banner image here that uh, the online learning pathways logo that we use on our web pages. So I'll, so, and you might have something else, another banner that you have created that you want to use or not, or, or just any image you want to use. You just select the image, click open, and that uploads the image to Canvas. All there is to it. You get a success message. And then you'll just click update to cause that image to appear in your rich content editor. Um, what you, you should do, yes, please. File. I'm sorry? You don't have to click the upload file? No, no, I already clicked that. Oh. I clicked that to start the process. Okay. I click update to finish it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good question. But there is something I should do first. I should provide some alternate text, which describes the picture in case a blind student is using a screen reader to access this page this text will be read to them and it'll tell them that this is the online learning, learning. <laughs> Sorry, I grew up in West Virginia. That's how we spell learning. Online learning, I can't seem to get past it. I'd like to tell you the E on my keyboard wasn't working. Online learning pathways logo. And then update. And that picture appears there. And your students will see it when they access this page. Great. Uh, so you can put text. You can put still images in. That's how you do it. You can put video in. Um, there's two or three different ways to put video in. You can pull video off 3C Media or Vimeo. You can search for video on YouTube by topic. Or if you have, if you have the web link, the URL for the video, you can just use this and probably better to use this insert edit media tool. The second one from the left, it looks like a little film frame. You click on that. You just need the URL, the link to the video. This of course assumes the video is online. I'm not talking about how to embed video that's stored on Canvas because we strongly recommend against storing video on Canvas. Canvas is not meant for that. Far better to pull to store video somewhere else like YouTube and then just link to it out of Canvas because it's going to play better. You have unlimited amount of storage space on YouTube. And um, also, if the video is uploaded to Canvas, the chances are it's not captioned. And that's a no, that's a huge no, no. So I have some, I'm going to put something in here that's actually stored on YouTube. I'm going to go look for it on YouTube. So it could easily be on another site, doesn't matter. YouTube's just the biggest video site in the world, this corner of the universe. And it's one that I have, it's a video I made, so I'm gonna look for my videos in my YouTube studio, in my list of videos. And let's see, I always have trouble finding this one. Intro.
I think this is the one I want. No. Oh, got to fix that. Just a second. I have another way to get it. <laughs> D -d 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 can never remember this. Come on. There we go. Uh, ba -ba 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 -bum 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 -bum. This is just for my benefit because I can't remember what I call it. Intro. Let's go copy video URL. In, intro to screen casting. So why is that not coming up? Because that's not the one I want. Oh, show all. That's the problem. That's the one. Sorry. YouTube messing with me. That's the video I want on YouTube. If I click on the little thumbnails for that and bring it up. Hi. And go to the share button for that video. There's the YouTube URL for that video. I just copy that to the clipboard and we have an entire course, which we'll be offering shortly on adding video to canvas. So this, I'm going through this kind of quickly. And then I just paste that URL into this source box here in the insert media tool and click okay. And boom. Oops. <laughs> well, I sort of put it in the wrong place. Hi everyone, and well, that things get inserted at the location that you have your cursor. So I'm going to, I'm just copying and pasting here to get stuff right back in the right place. Ugh. You can do that sort of thing with the rich content editor as well. And there is an, a video embed, so-called because it shows you a frame from the video and gives you a play button. I did not actually upload the video to Canvas. All I'm doing is creating a, uh, an engaging link to that video. It's still stored on YouTube. And when a student, let's save that and then re-enter it. When a student clicks on this play button in the embed, then the video begins to play. Hi everyone, and welcome to Introduction to... They can full screen it if, it's, if they need to see it better. Oh God, sorry. Uh, that's way bigger than I need to be in this case. But um, they can even go to YouTube and play it. And so they have full control over playback of the video, but um, they have access to it right from within this Canvas page. But Dave, so that is actually still on YouTube. It's that is actually, it is on YouTube. I did not load it into Canvas. The embed, so it's not taking us up space in Canvas. You didn't do that I, embed six character zero question mark code thing. So when you uh, do that embed code, you you taught us that other class. That right. is when in taking up space. No, it's not taking up space either. That's just an alternate way to embed a video into oh, Canvas. Right. It gives you gives you a little bit more flexibility, okay. but it basically works the same way. Um, also that uh, the using the embed code for the video will work with uh, sites other than, video sites other than YouTube. Okay. Where creating the embed this way by just pasting the URL for the video in the source box 
on the in the insert edit media tool only works for YouTube videos. Oh, okay. So it's there's a little there's some detail there that we're not going into right now because that's not really the focus of this session. But that's the easy way to put a YouTube video in to your course into a is to embed it into a Canvas page. It's not the only way, as I'll show you in a moment, but it is the more common way. All right, what else can we use the rich content editor to put into a Canvas page? Well, I mentioned we could put hyperlinks in, links to content outside of Canvas. Like maybe, uh, like I say, if you were, um, if I were teaching a course in screencasting, certainly I'd want people to know, to be able to get to the website of a company called TechSmith, which is the number one vendor of, of screencasting software in the world. How can I give them a link to that site? Well, I have to have the URL, the web address for that site, which happens to be www.techsmith.com. I can verify that by going to that website to make sure I type that right. Then I can just copy this to the clipboard. Oops, well, I cut it, that's all right, I don't care. I meant to copy it. Now, if I wanna create a link to that website, I have to have what's called an anchor, which is usually just some text but can be a picture or whatever, or it can be a picture as well. But usually it's some text, like TechSmith website. Might even be properly typed text. Not my strong suit. All right, I just highlight that text that I've typed and click this link to URL or hyperlink button in the rich content editor. And then I just paste that URL that I copied to my clipboard into this, in, into this link or URL box, just what it tells you. And you insert the link. Now, if I save that, it, things don't operate right from within the editor necessarily. If I save that, this is what the student would see. And the student can click on that link and go to the TechSmith website. That's an external URL or hyperlink in Canvas, in a Canvas page. That's one of the most basic types of editing in a web page. Web pages almost always contain links to other web pages outside of Canvas. And that's how you create one. Pretty simple. You can also create links to content inside Canvas. This is something you couldn't do in the Blackboard editor. I, don't, I really like this. I, I've got a whole lot, a list of stuff over here on the right that I can create links to in this Canvas page under the Links tab over here. Um, I can link to other pages. I can link to homework assignments, quizzes. I could put a link to a quiz in a Canvas page. The student click on that link in, in the Canvas page and they go right to the quiz, rather than having to go back to the module to get it. Say uh, I can go to announcements, discussion forums. I can go to individual modules in the modules tool, or I can go to course navigation and I can link to the assignments tool, the pages tool. I can link to stuff that's in this course menu like the modules. That's the, the key, they're the heart of the course. I might edit that to be course modules, right? That's, a, that's an internal or a link to something inside Canvas. If I click on that, the student can then come in, click on that and go right to their modules that we're creating here. Maybe I'll put that welcome thing up the top there. <laughs> uh, so they can always access that page. So that's how you create a Canvas page. 
and some of the things that you can put into it, most of the things that you can put into it. The rest I leave to your imagination and your needs. Uh, why would you, uh, a question I often get at this point is, why would you bother to create a Canvas page if maybe you have this content already in a file somewhere? Well, first off, you might not have it in a file somewhere, and it's probably as easy to create on Canvas as it is to create it in Word or whatever. Uh, another reason is that this they can't download, not easily anyway unless they really know what they're doing. This stays on Canvas. They can access it and use it, but they can't download it easily. They can't edit, they can't change the content in any way. Uh, so it's secure, it's not gonna change on you. And it loads faster for them. Uh, that if you have a big Word document that you're sharing with your students, even the, that viewer that we saw can take a little while for that to bring up that Word document. A Canvas page, on the other hand, usually loads instantly. So the student clicks on a link to a Canvas page in a module, it pops right up. They don't have to wait for the little, little whirling symbol to have the Word document pop up or whatever. Or PDF document or PowerPoint file, whatever. So creating this sort of content in Canvas pages is, appears for the students much more rapidly. And you can put things into these Canvas pages that are more difficult, that are fairly difficult to put into, or, or more difficult to put into things like Word documents, like this embedded video, or these hyperlinks are, are easier to put in here than they are in Word. So Canvas pages are likely to constitute a large fraction of your content that you put into your course, particularly content that you're creating de novo from scratch. So, and that's how you do it, using the rich content editor. That rich content editor is also used, of course, not just for Canvas pages, but it's what you use when you create a when you or the students create a discussion post. It's what the students use when you give them a text box to answer a question in a test. Uh, the rich content editor is used. It's used to create announcements. It's it's used univer almost universally whenever you create whenever you type text or embed pictures or whatever into something in Canvas, the rich content editor is the tool that you use. So it's an exceptionally uh, important tool in Canvas. So that's why we spend so much time on it in this session. Um, I will tell you that the, yes, question. Okay, Sorry? so pages, this, what you show us is in pages, and in the modules, but we can choose. Do you often choose not to let the students look at the pages? Yeah, you mean the pages tool here? Right. Generally not. Generally do not allow them to look at the pages oh. there because they see them in a chaotic order. Yes, yes. You know, there's really no reason to give them access to the pages tool. Typically, they would access all of your content through the modules. Okay. Good question. And that's, that's also true for their homework assignments and their quizzes. We don't usually give them access to those tools either. If you give them access to the quizzes tool, they can just go and look and see what all your quizzes are. And as soon as they become, as soon as the availability dates pass, they can start trying to take the quizzes without ever looking at any of your course content, uh, which is not good pedagogy. So we typically don't even give them that option. We hide that tool from them. That's what that little slashed eye means, of course. So that's how you create files or how you load files and create pages in Canvas, which constitutes most of your content. 
But there is a third content type that you can put right into a module that's similar to what, something we just did in that page, which is to create a, a, an external hyperlink, uh, an external URL link in a Canvas module. Before I do that, I'm going to create another module. I create extra modules just by clicking this Add Module button up here in the upper right. And I just have to give it a name. I'm going to call this Topic 1. Uh, I think I called that Why Screencasting. Why would you bother learning about that? I'll add that module. And I just have a blank module here. And I can add that, I can add to that something called an external URL, uh, which is just a hyperlink, a web link, which you see in web pages all the time. But this is, I'm adding it directly to the module here instead of to a Canvas page. I showed you how to add one of these to a Canvas page a moment ago. But I can add the external link right into a module if I find that appropriate by just selecting external URL and then I just need a name for the link and the URL the web address and a uh, something I might want to do in, in this is a uh, uh, search for the TechSmith Guide to Screencasting, which is a general introduction to the topic of screencasting. There it is, the ultimate guide. What is screencasting and why would you bother? And here's the URL for it in the uh, address line of my browser, the web address. I can just copy that to my clipboard and go back to Canvas and paste that in the box labeled URL. Right click paste or control V or command V on a Mac. Uh, Curse of Babel, revisit it again. Um, and then I have to give it a name. I, basically I have to provide some words for the student to click on. And this I'll just call this the guide to screencasting. And I can choose or not to load it in a new tab and then add the item. And if I publish all of that, the students will be able to see it. And then they can just click on this link and that will take them right to that website. So that's your third type of content to go along with files that you create on your local computer and upload to Canvas, then the pages that you create on Canvas, and this external URL allows you to pull in web pages from outside Canvas. So that's sort of the nickel tour of how to add content to your Canvas course. You create modules, and then within the uh, and you create the modules according to the organization of your course, uh, how you logically organize your content in your mind, and then you add you upload files that you already have on your local com or that you have created on your local computer to Canvas, or that you've downloaded off the web or somebody gave it to you on a thumb drive. It doesn't matter where the file came from, you can upload it to Canvas. Or you create Canvas pages on Canvas. Or you, uh, in, uh, you insert hyperlinks to content that's available out on the web. And those are the three content types that you can put into Canvas within your modules. Content. We're not talking about assessments. We'll talk about assignments, quizzes, graded discussions tomorrow. Um, or you can go and watch the many, many recordings we have of each of these online at sdccdolvid.org. 
our on-demand website. Let me put that in the chat tool. So you have that. Remember, I see I'm sharing my screen. Yep. Remember, you can save this chat log by going to the, if you're on a computer, if you go to the long, to the lower right hand corner of the chat tool, or the chat window, um, and you'll see a, a little more button there. It's three dots in a line. If you click on that and click save chat, that will save the uh, chat log to your local computer, you'll find it in a folder called in your documents area on PC or Mac in a folder called Zoom. That folder called Zoom will have subfolders that are dated and timed. This is the one from today, 611. Open that up and there here's your meeting, your chat log that's saved. You just double click that and it will come up. And that's the current chat log. Obviously can only save what's appeared up to now. So this is something you probably, if you want to save that, you probably want to do it. Try to remember to do it just before you leave the meeting. David, or you, I prom you can save it multiple times. Yes. Uh, I promised you to remem remind everybody to sign in their name and the... Oh, thank uh, you. Yes. And if you if you haven't already put your name and your address in that chat tool, uh, or your name and your email address, I should say, uh, in the chat tool, I would appreciate that. So I'll have a roster. Thank you so much <laughs> for the reminder. Uh, anyway, on this on-demand video site, there's a button at the top called Workshop Archives. If you click on that, all of our recordings are in here. And there, here's the last time we did this on May 12th, I guess it was, yeah. So, and uh, assessment in Canvas was done right after that. So those are always available. And this one will be up there soon. All right, let's go back to Canvas. Let's see, there's one more thing I want to show you about content creation in Canvas before I turn this over for questions. And that's how to maybe make your course entry a little more salubrious, <laughs> a little more um, attractive for your students. By default, when the student enters the course, they see the modules. And that's not a bad default because if they go to the modules, then, the, you know, they can they know where to get started and they know what to do next. They can find your content. Yes, Yusra. Uh, you're muted, Yusra. You unmute yourself. I'm sorry, we're not hearing you. Yeah. There you go. Hello, everyone. Um, is it okay if you give me a few minutes, um, uh, you know, uh, as soon as possible? Because I am leaving. My granddaughter is graduating from the oh, North yeah, absolutely. High School. Well, I'm about, I'm about, I'm less than five minutes away from the end. Now. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you you bet. So, um, but this is not the only course entry point you can select. So it's, a, it's not a bad one. But uh, a common practice in Canvas is to have an opening page that the students see first. And that's kind of what I was creating here when I created this welcome page. It was in anticipation of making that the first thing students see when they enter the course. And it's quite simple to do that. Uh, you go to, um, first thing you do is go to your pages tool in the course menu and you find the page that you want the students to, this has to be a can, well, in this case that we're talking about making a canvas page, the first thing the student sees when they enter. 
you find the page, in this case it's just one, <laughs> and you go out to the right here to the content, the context menu for that page and click on those three dots and you select use as front page. When you do that, a little icon pops up that reminds you that this is gonna be your front page. So you'd think at this point that if you just went back to home that that front page would appear. Unfortunately not <laughs> yet. There's one more thing you have. This is not the most intuitive thing in Canvas. But from the home link on your course menu, there's a menu over here on the right where there's an option to choose the home page. You might legitimately say, I thought I already did that, <laughs> but it's a two step process. You now have to choose the home page. And there are five things that should really say choose entry point because there are five different things you can pick as the course entry point. You can have the students see the course activity stream, which is just kind of a stream of consciousness of what's been going on in the course. Or you can send them directly to the assignments list, which I don't recommend. Or to their, the course syllabus tool, which might not be a bad thing. But the two most commonly used options here are the course modules, which is the default, so that they see the modules right off the bat when they enter the course. The other option is to see the pay, the other commonly used option is the option to see the Canvas page that you've designated as the front page or as the opening page. And if you select that and click save, then when they enter the course or when they click on the home link, they'll see this opening page. Just be sure if you do this, that there's a clear path to your course modules. And I don't mean having to go over here and click on the module to have the student have to know to go over here and click on the modules link in the course menu. That's why I put this internal link here. This might say start here <laughs> or something equally unambiguous. And then if the student clicks on the course on that link, then they go to the modules. So that's how you create an opening page. And that's something you might want to do for your course. And you can put pictures of yourself in there. You can put graphics uh, associated with your subject. Uh, uh, you know, you can make it very attractive and very welcoming for the student. More than just, just the facts, ma'am, which is <laughs> what you get with the modules. Okay. That concludes my syllabus for today. Okay. And I am willing to take questions now. Okay, can I, uh, can I show you my, um, uh, I'm confused about the grades and about the discussions. Can I show you my, uh, share my screen? Of course, let me Thank stop you. my, all right. You may now share your screen. Okay, uh, let me do this. Share my screen. Okay, we're sharing my screen. Okay, and here it is. Share. Maybe you were going to show us about the uh, tripod also. Don't forget. I will. I'll do that the very next thing. Right. Okay, um, here is my screen about the grades and. Um, yes. I can see, I don't mind anyone see the scores. Um, mm -hmm. Here it is. Uh, why I'm getting on this one five from 10? I, re, uh, I re, um, uh, redid this and, um, you know, I sent it. May it. Just, it may just be that your resubmission has not yet been graded. Oh, okay. But uh, I will be happy if you will if you will remind me to do that by sending me an email. I'll go in and look, and if okay. it hasn't been graded, I'll grade it for you. Thank you so much. And uh, about the video, I did I did that. Why it's not uh, it's not showing the video? Yes. Oh, you you appear to have. Uh, 
Okay, you've got a you've got some feedback here. I and which I, of course I can't click on just on this image. Um, okay. I would have to look at that as well. So why don't you include that in the email and I'll take a look at that one for you as well. Okay. Um, and the thing about discussions, um, why I can't get the discussions? I did all this, 3.3. .3. I did that one. And uh, uh, I just don't know why I am uh, not uh, getting the again, if you Again, if you'll put that in an email, I'll take a look at it. And I'll I'll see what's going on there for you. Okay, okay. Uh, that, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah, uh, the way the way it's done, uh, I go to modules, right, and then you click. I click yes. where that assignment, and then I will um, say, uh, is it um, a reply? Uh, is it reply or something? Yes, reply? hit reply. Hit reply. Yeah, and, and then I, I go, post. yeah, and uh, I'm just uh, wondering, am I doing but the I'd, right I'd thing? But I'd have to go into the course and look at, your, at the grade book there, and that's not something I want to do in a public forum like this. That's, that's so, okay. I just want to know why I'm getting this, I those grades. And yeah. I'll take a look at that for you. Okay, okay. now I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and um but, and One more question. Something. Yes. One more uh -huh. question. Uh, when um, uh, when I um, you know I see something to read, usually uh, maybe I don't read it online, but I make copies uh, and shows uh, I view no. it. No, I read it. I did not view it. I read it. Why it says view? Uh, normally, they would expect you to read it on the screen, but you're certainly welcome to print it out and read it as well. You certainly I, I, print, I print everything because my my eyes are from just yeah. reading on the screen. Is mm -hmm. that yeah, that's uh, fine? Okay, that's no, fine. no points and taken. Then you can certainly legitimately say that you have viewed it. <laughs> you can't. Uh, that's that's not a problem. Thank that's you. That's so up much. to you. Thank you're you back. so much. Thank you. you bet. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. you Thank too. you, everyone. Good luck. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. Time to go. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, um, the, and darn it, I think my phone has died on me, so I want to plug this in here to illustrate the next question. Um, we, uh, we've talked a lot in Zoom sessions about using, yeah, darn it, that died on me. I should have plugged that in before I started. Um, uh, in Zoom sessions about using document cameras, which allow you to show, oh, that's not, just not gonna work, is it? I'm sorry, I'm res wrestling with something here. And I can't really show you the this in operation because my phone has died, and I can't. And I don't want to wait for you to have to wait to for that to charge back up. But um, we have. Let me share my screen here. I've quite frequently seen me use this document camera. Where you can put three-dimensional objects. My wife's a children's librarian, so oh. I have, just happen to have a children's book handy. Uh, um, where you can show three-dimensional objects or documents, books, a piece of paper that you can write on, gives you your whiteboard back. Hmm. But these document cameras are fairly expensive and fairly hard to, uh, in the range of a hundred bucks and hard to come by right now because everybody in the world wants one. An alternative to a document camera is to use your smartphone instead of a document camera. And let me show you what I mean here. 
the document camera and I have a, a uh, let me get this out of the way and stop my share so I can pick up another webcam here. Oops. Well, that's, uh, shoot. It's, uh, the exposure is all wrong there. Let me just use the webcam I've got set. That's, this is a document camera, USB document camera. And it's nice to have and it works very well, but it is expensive and it is hard to come by right now. An alternative is to use your smartphone as a document camera. The camera in the smartphone is quite good. The problem being that you have to, you know, how do you suspend the, the cell phone or the smartphone in the air above what you want to show? And uh, come, uh, you, there are various um, do-it-yourself hacks to doing that, and we published some of them. But it'd be nice to have something a little bit more reliable and easier to work with, and that is this. Um, this is a, a tripod that I got from Amazon. It's fully adjustable height-wise, and it ends in a flexible neck that you can move about. And it's got a mount on the end that will hold a smartphone or a small tablet, like an iPad mini is about the biggest you can get in there, or a Kindle. Kindle will work, both of which also have cameras in them that you can use. They also have Zoom apps that you can use to put the phone or the tablet into the meeting and have it function as a document camera. And this allows you to reliably and stably safely hold your phone up in the air like that. This little, just a little spring-loaded holder that grabs the phone or the, or the uh, Kindle or the iPad mini and holds it in the right place vertically over, over top. And that works. I, I didn't want to talk too much about this until I'd actually gotten one of them and evaluated it and see if it was a piece of junk or not. And it, it's not. Uh, the folks from the directions that came with it, it was obviously not made around these parts, but the construction's quite good and solid and uh, it looks like it's gonna last pretty well. And I got this from Amazon. go back to my orders here so I'm sure I get the right one. There it is. And it was quite a bit less expensive than the document camera since I already had the smartphone. Um, it was, oh, currently unavailable. Shoot. Oh. But, there, but there are similar ones. What company? That are available. I would, uh, this one I think is probably the same thing. And that one's even cheaper. Yeah. And that one is available for $26. And it, this one looks like it's not quite, it doesn't have quite the number of adjustments, but it should be fine. Looks very comparable uh, construction. Can you, you share our, your screen so we could see? Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I forgot I wasn't doing that. Just a second, I certainly can find it. There it is. Thank you. Okay. There we go. This one I suspect they will have back, but the, this one, this one looks 
very comparable and mm -hmm. has two, two, two telescoping tubes. This is probably the most, the closest to it. And that's about the price I paid. It's just a slight, it's a different company. But these turned out to be, to, to be fine and work very well. Indeed, it looks identical to the one I've got. Except which that mine's got three tubes instead of two. Where, which one was yours, just so I can see it? It was this one. And it's floor that, stand. That looks, that looks, it's a, called a floor stand. I'll put the link to it in the chat tool. Okay. Oops, that sent it to the wrong person. There we go, that sent it to everybody. And I'll um, also send this other one, the link to the one that they have right now that looks identical to it. You were saying it has, yours has three tubes. Where are those, what are those tubes for? Uh, extension. Oh, I get it. This, I've got it sitting on the floor. You might also sit it on a desk, but the feet are a little big for that. So I've got it sitting on the floor and this one's a little taller, but I'm I'm barely got it extended, so that's more than enough. What they had they what they another thing they showed using this for was holding your smartphone or your tablet in place over top of your um, bathtub, <laughs> so that you could <laughs> you you could relax in your bath and still have your smartphone or your tablet handy. <laughs> that's weird. That, that's yeah. I, I don't anticipate using it for that, but the, uh, but anyway, that's the link to that, and that's what that and that makes a great that makes the cell phone a great document camera. I wish I hadn't let the battery run down. I was going to show you how good the image was, but it's at least as good as the image from the document camera. I also and, want. You probably already have the smartphone, so you don't have to spend a hundred bucks. You might spend thirty bucks for the tripod instead of a hundred bucks for the uh, smartphone, or a hundred bucks for the document camera. And you can get a tripod now, and you probably—it's hard to get that document camera right now. So I, yeah. we were talking about it also in reference to my doing a video on my phone and yes. having to hold the phone out. So I had right. to focus on the phone, I had to focus on what I was saying. So this was and, a clear. And indeed, this would give you a stable holder that right. you could use to use your smartphone to record video. Though, to tell you the truth, probably a better option for that is a standard photo tripod. I've got a little tiny one here I'll show you. Mm. With a smartphone holder on it. Sorry, I have to switch out accessories here. All right. Let me swap the phone here. Oh, that thing is stiff. It's new. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, same sort of thing. This is another alternative if you just want to record video off your smartphone. Is a small tripod. It, it can be a the the holder screws onto a standard tripod. So you'd use any tripod. 
go and buy a little uh, uh, lightweight photo tripod from Walmart or uh, Amazon. Mm -hmm. This happens to be a desktop one, which is handy too. And then the holder goes, screws onto the tripod and the phone is held, is grabbed by the holder, by the, yeah. And the holder itself looks like this. You can get this from Amazon as well. Just a little clamp that holds the phone, that screws onto the tripod. So that, and then that gives you the ability to pan, tilt, zoom, and so on, uh, like a photo tripod. So either one of those will work for that. The, the big one, the floor standing holder, is probably better for a document camera mm. and for just something to hold your phone while you're recording a video. And this is cheaper. This was about seven or eight dollars. The tripod, eh, now probably by the time you end up buying a little tripod and the holder, you're gonna be somewhere in the rough ballpark of this big one. But it's just a matter of what, what's going to work. If you're just going to be sitting down statically in front of it yourself, this would work fine. And it also gives you the option to use the smartphone as the document camera. Right. It's more versatile, really. It is more versatile in that way. If you are going to be recording something happening on your smartphone, uh, like if you were going to go out to an event and record the event on your smartphone, the little camera mm -hmm. with the pan tilt zoom head would, be, or the little tripod with the pan tilt zoom head would probably be better. So it's just a matter of what you're going to use it for. But those are a couple of accessories that will allow you to leverage the camera in your smartphone. Yeah. Um, you can even, there are apps that you can use that are very inexpensive that will allow you to use your smartphone as a, as a webcam. As I'm, you know, as I'm talking to you on my webcam right now, you're seeing me because I have a webcam. Well, you would be seeing me if I stopped my screen share. Okay, you're seeing me, I'm talking to you and you're seeing me through a webcam that's clipped to the top of my monitor here. Uh, you can use your smartphone in lieu of that webcam too, because the webcams are harder to find right now than the, uh, than the document cameras. Webcams are just scarce as hen's teeth right now. And you can leverage your smartphone that you already have probably, or a small tablet as well, uh, to use as a, in lieu of a webcam. So those are just some tricks. Yes, Arda. Um, I just need an extension cord. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of extension? You mean a power cord or an, a USB extension? One of these for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can buy those from Amazon as well. You can get yeah. extension like ten or fifteen foot extension USB yeah. extension cords. Yeah, let me show you where like that. about three feet long. This thing. It's exactly. Not it's not very. I understand. Yeah. Best Buy and Office Depot too, Arden. What? You can get that also at yeah, you can, Office Depot. Okay. Right. right. You can buy these at most any uh, computer store that sells computer equipment, though yeah. sometimes finding them can be a little challenging. Oh, but here's okay. a, um, this is a three meter, uh, 10 Are foot. Are going to share your screen? Oh, gosh. I keep forgetting that today. Yeah, I do that too. Uh, that's a, that is a bad thing. All right. Yeah. Now I got it. Cuz you're not on it all the time, you do work on it, so you don't think about sharing it. Exactly. I'm just thinking it's already up there. Here we go. Right. Uh here it is. Wait, we're still nope. seeing you. The, oh, sorry. No, I grabbed, no. the, grabbed the wrong one. Just a sec. Maybe That's I the one I want. Okay, here we go. Oh, all right. Uh, here's a six dollar, ten foot extension cord or ex okay. a USB extension. Yeah, and this Amazon that. Basic stuff works. I, okay. That's my usually my preference rather than spending a lot more money on some Let other brand name. That real quick. All right. And 
and I'll put that, let me put that uh, link in the chat tool what? for you. Oh, well. Artis, what do you need that for? For my document camera. Yeah. It was like a three feet, a three oh. board. It was not very long. And um, it gets in the way of the, of the picture when I have to hook it up to my computer. Exactly. Oh. Yeah, I've got a couple of USB extension cables on this uh, 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 setup I've got here. And they work fine. Dave, so could I? Can, yes, absolutely. Could I see the Amazon page? I wanted to take a picture, but now I see us. Over absolutely. The there you go. Thank you. So All right. Thank you. And I realized I just sent that privately to artists, so let me send it to everybody. This oh, link. Oh, yeah. I already saved it, so I guess I better resave it. Oh, wow. That's a long link. Yeah, you, you don't want to try to type that. You want to um, <laughs> click on it, bring up the page, and bookmark it. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. And remember, you can uh, save that, and you can always copy and paste it into a web browser later. Right. Yeah, those yeah. Amazon links are immense. I had a question. Oh. All right. Yeah. In, since I'm teaching speech class, students sometimes have to show their PowerPoint, and I want to be able to see them and their presentation at the same time so if a student right. has right if a student has a computer correctly uh done it's problem but some students still have a technical issue or they have a tablet so since most right. of the students, i don't have a smartphone but most of my students do and so would setting it up on a tripod like that be helpful for them because what i had them do is i always think really cheap and poor most of them, I said, well, just take your smartphone if you have one and show yourself like holding the computer. I have to see you and the computer at the same time. Yeah. Some of the students, although I, I noticed it's mostly girls, not the guys, on the back of their, I don't know if it's a girly thing, but on the back of their smartphones, they have like a knob and they're, they're cute. I mean, they have little cute little animals or fancy little knobs. Right. They'll mm -hmm. fit it on a mug or something sturdy so your hands are free right. while you're doing that. So I'm thinking a tripod, I, I know I never think, well, a tripod sounds more technical, but maybe they should, if they're gonna do presentations, invest in a, a like a table tripod and that would work, I think. Yeah, but that little, that little nub that goes on the back of the phone's a lot cheaper. Indeed, yeah. sometimes they're given out as party favors. Yeah, so they're, they're really work. inexpensive, but yeah, but it, but it can be, it's less reliable in terms of holding the phone in a position where they can, and they, they either have to have that or they have to have a webcam. Okay. And, you know, and the, uh, but if they, if they're operating from their smartphone or their tablet, you should see them when they share that screen. No. It, it it won't do both. And as a speech instructor, I have to see them and their presentation. Right. Right. It's important to see them than the presentation. Okay, yeah, they're using the smartphone to actually access the Zoom meeting. Yeah, so not using it like a webcam, yeah. Yeah. But that yeah. wouldn't that wouldn't change that though. Uh, they'd still be having to use the smartphone, the tablet to access the Zoom meeting. And that yeah is apparently what the problem is. Um, so the tripod really, it would hold the phone for them, Yeah. But yeah. it wouldn't it'd change the way the phone operated. It would just make it more stable. So okay. I don't know that that, uh, yeah, and, that, and a lot of students are accessing the course and presenting using their smartphone or their tablet. They may not even have a computer. Although they on the campus, but. but yeah, I think when you actually when you share the screen on the phone, you're right. The uh, the phone does not send what the camera is seeing; it just sends the phone screen. Well, that's why so I said that. there's not much you can do about that. I'm afraid. It. So it was kind of awkward, but it it did work for the few students who did. But I'm wondering if maybe that's why some students weren't able to complete it because they didn't have that or 
Well, certainly the little tripod would give them a more stable hold for their phone. That's pro they're, you're probably talking, like, like I say, it's probably going to cost them between 20 and $30 to get the tripod and the holder. Yeah. But the little table that little knob <laughs> that they can just kind of prop up on something on a coffee cup or something. So that's why um, I would give them, them. would give them a, a reasonably stable camera image and would be next to next to free. I'm not sure. Let me see if Amazon has anything like that. Um, just checking offline here. Cell phone holder. No, this is mostly more complex stuff. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about with that little thing that just is usually just a little suction cup that sticks to the back it. of the phone. I didn't know what it was called, like a suction cup knob or holder. They're like yeah. nine cents, no more than a couple of dollars. You see exactly. them all. Exactly. And it's, um, yeah, they should be able to make that work. Okay. I can't imagine that would be an impediment that would prevent them from doing the presentation. Hey, but, I have a question if, if it's okay. Yes, if this Cindy. Is a good time. Hi. Uh -huh. um, I have some students who are, I think it's usually when they're on their phone, they say, teacher, the screen is blurry. So this is in Zoom when I'm sharing my screen. And other, I ask other students, can you see the screen? And a lot of people say yes, but some students it's blurry. Why is that? That can be a bandwidth issue on their end. Oh. If most of the students are seeing it fine, then it's coming through. It's being transmitted in good, good resolution. But if the, um, uh, if it's uh, coming in blurry to just one or two people, the chances are good that it's a bandwidth issue on their end, which you have no control over, or their their phone may just have a very low resolution screen. Some low end Android phones have very poor screen resolution. Oh, and that can happen whether they're on their computer or their phone, right? It's, so it doesn't have to do with yeah. them being on a phone. It has to do with it their could, internet it bandwidth. It could happen on the computer as well. That's right, if their okay. bandwidth gets real low. Um, you can also change the video setting on your computer a little bit. So it, where it says like next to where the little video icon is, and when you click that little, I don't know what you call the up or down, the uh, download, and it says video settings, and it says enhance the video. Yeah, let me uh, let me show you what we're talking about here. The uh, oh, well, no, I can't really do I can't really do that because I don't get that. But at, when I'm sharing the screen, if you look at the top, if you're on a computer, if you look at the top of your screen, you should see a little button up there that says view options. Uh-huh, I see and it. If you click on that, there are options to expand, to, to magnify the screen, or change or the way it it's displayed. Mm -hmm. And okay. that may be, that may help them. Oh. It may not be so much that it's blurry, it's just too small for them to see. Oh, okay. The resolution that they've got. If they're, on a smart, if they're on a smartphone or a tablet and viewing your shared screen, they can usually pinch zoom and zoom in on the image by just putting their thumb and their forefinger on the screen and then spreading them apart. They'll know how to do that. And that okay. can magnify what you're showing and that may help them. So that's something you can suggest. But if the video is just blurry and it's not happening for everyone, then it's most likely just a, a bandwidth issue on their end, and there's unfortunately not much you can do about that. Okay. What you can suggest, and then I, uh -huh. if, you're, if you're recording, you can suggest that they go back and watch that part of the presentation again on the recording, and probably oh, on okay. the recording it will be sharper. Okay, and then I have one more question, but it has to do with Canvas, and um, my fine. email, Okay, um, it's my email with the district, and instead of the students emailing me there automatically through their inbox in Canvas, I'd like to have right. it sent to a different email that I created just for students, no matter what class it is. 
but right. I couldn't get it to take. Like I, I added it, but it's not doing it. Oh, you added it to Canvas? Yeah. Uh, that can take some time for that change to, uh, to. Well, David, can I share my screen? Because I'm not sure if I did it correctly. So. Okay, sure. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Let me kill my share and you go right ahead. Okay. So let's see, where is Canvas? Um, well, I should be able to do it here. Okay. So up there you here. Go. Let's see. Okay. So it is, oh, oh, it's over here. Okay, on the right. So you can see my email yeah. address. Right. And That's here's the new one. Here's the one you've added, but it hasn't. Uh, it doesn't yeah. have to be you, do, you can't make that your default email yet. That can take so when did you put that email address? In? I think I did it um, probably last Friday or Saturday oh, or you should've. know how these, these days shown, run together. Yeah, that <laughs> should have happened by now. Um, yeah, as Canvas has come under heavier and heavier load, this is a setting that seems to take longer and longer to actually. Um, do I have to do contact method or no, 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 that, that's settings? something else entirely. No, you've okay. done the right thing. But There's this nothing black more star you can do. Should... What you might try is deleting. You see the little trash can icon to the left of your Gmail there. Uh -huh. You might try deleting that and adding it again. Mm. Oh, see okay. if that if it if it works this time that has been a little uh that that particular setting change has been taking longer and longer to take effect uh-huh so try it again and see if it doesn't and it still won't it won't become the uh default email address you won't be able to make it the default email address right away but eventually you should be able to do that there's nothing in our Canvas settings that should stop you from doing that. Okay. Okay, Another super. Thank you. Another thing to consider is that what you really may want to, so you really want any messaging that comes from Canvas to go to your Gmail account and not to your district account. Correct. Is what, is what I'm understanding. Is that correct? Yeah. And do, isn't that a good idea to do? Because otherwise, I like, to, I like to do that myself. Yes, yeah. because I do, it doesn't get mixed in with all my district email that way. Yeah, because right now we're getting so many emails. I don't want to miss a student's email. I understand entirely, and that yeah. yes, I think that's a best practice. There is one downside to doing that that I need to mention to you, though. The okay. Confer Zoom app, if you use that in Canvas will not uh -huh. work if you change your uh, default, your primary email address in Canvas to something other than your district email account. Oh, well that's terrible because maybe uh, yesterday, several students said, teacher, your link is not working for Zoom. And it always has in the past. So do you think that's why? Because I changed my no, I don't think that had gone through on Canvas yet. I, I think we well, I you, better you delete just have it. to look at your Confer better, Zoom better, app to see. I better delete I mean, it though I because I can't have here. that happen. No, that, that really shouldn't, having that as a secondary email address should not interfere with your Confer Zoom app. And that, Wait, and that even if it did interfere with the Confer Zoom app, it would not stop any Zoom links that you've sent to your students in other ways from working. All that does is affect the Confer Zoom app in Canvas. It doesn't actually affect your Zoom account. I didn't mean to imply that. So no, I don't think that that would be another issue, most likely. Okay, I'm sorry, Dave. What did you say the disadvantage was then? Because I don't think I understood. Okay, let me, I tell you what, let me share my screen and I'll show you what I mean. Okay. I, I'm going to go ahead and share. I, you don't have to do anything. I'm just going to go ahead and share mine. Um, that's a, a 
a power that you retain as the, by default, as the instructor. If you share your screen, it stops anybody else's screen share from appearing. Now, here I am in Canvas. If I go to my account, yes, I changed my avatar image. Um, <laughs> uh, if I go to settings. And you chose a villain. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah. yeah, but he was kind of a charming villain. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a little clueless, clueless. Oh no, let me go. Actually, let me go into a. Uh, you know, and I and it, to really show you this, I have to log out as Boris here, and log in as another account that I have that has instructor privileges uh, only. It's not my admin account. If I go into a. Um, a canvas shell. What I'm talking about is this confer zoom app over here in the course menu. Oh. And that's yeah, an alternate think... way to schedule events or schedule zoom meetings and um, and so on. But if you don't use that, you don't have to worry about what email address you're using. In okay, yeah, I don't think I use that in canvas. Okay. So don't worry about that then. Okay. Now, the, um, as far as the settings, the, the email address goes, if you put in another email address, even if it's not your primary address, Canvas will still send uh, notifications to it, will still send emails to it that you receive if you tell it to do so. It will probably send, it will probably send them to your can, uh, your uh, district email address as well, but it will send more than one email address if you like, so you don't run the risk of missing um, uh, messages that your students send you in Canvas. And so you I'm can set get double, that up. Double Pardon? email? Yeah, you can get double emails. Indeed, you can tell it, you can tell, yeah, I know, uh, that's not ideal, but in fact, you can tell it not to send you emails at your district email address. Let me go back to my uh, primary persona here, and I'll show you how, how to set this up. Um, if I go, this is my, I have multiple email addresses associated with this account. If I go to my account button and go to settings, you can see I have two email addresses, my district email and my Yahoo email, personal email. And I have them both in there. And if you wait long enough, they will both show up. And I can, and you can make either one of them the primary after a while, but that may take quite some time the, um, to be able to do that because it requires a setting to promulgate, to percolate through all the Canvas servers all around the world before that changes. I don't know why that's the case, but it seems to be. But anyway, I've got two email addresses in here, just as you would if you put your Gmail account in. To control what gets sent to those email addresses, I can go to my notification settings to my account in Canvas. And both of those email addresses will be listed. I'll have a column in this notification settings for each. And the, um, uh, the critical one is conversation message. Uh, Canvas calls that messaging tool the conversation tool. So if you go to conversation message and set that to send you a notification every time you get a message in your Canvas inbox, you can tell it to send that to either or both of your email addresses. For this event, this conversation message, you have four options. You can send, uh, you can have Canvas send an email to you immediately upon you receiving a message in your Canvas inbox, or you can tell Canvas to send you one message at the end of the day listing all of the messages that you received that day or once a week, or don't send me a message at this email account if I get a message in my Canvas inbox. I happen to have both of mine <laughs> turned on. I've got check marks for both. Now this first one is my personal email address. The second column is my um, district email address. 
if I go to a conversation message and if I turn off that messaging, that notification for my um, district email address, it will not send those messages on to my district email address, but it will send them to my personal email address, given the way I've got this set up right now. I've got my personal email address set to get the notification and my district set not to. Okay, so that's a little tricky. I gotta be careful. It's, it's a little involved, but it does work. And it's reliable. And how do you know what the first column is, the second column, the third column, and the fourth column? It tells you right here. But I mean, the you. check doesn't tell me what the check is, and the clock doesn't tell me what the clock is. Oh, yeah. Here, here's the. Here's oh, there the it check. is. There's that legend. Okay. Right there. Okay. Thank you. Right I got it. And okay. here, and the column header tells you which email address. Okay. I can tell you the problem of of having students having your personal email address. It's one thing to have the notifications like Dave said, but teachers, especially female teachers, are the second largest group that are stalked by students. And now the, and the, if you have it sent, like I have my students send everything to the Canvas inbox. Even though I don't like the way it's structured because it doesn't tell me immediately which class they're in, but at least it goes there, not to, because our regular email fills up very quickly. But if you have it sent right. to the Canvas account, you are protected by the Canvas from any student that has said anything uh, that you don't want said to you or you want a record of what a student has said to you. You have it sent to your personal email address then it has to become a police matter, but they're just too busy with so many other things to worry about some student who stalks you. And there's two different kinds of stalkers. There's the ones who love you and then the ones who hate you because you can't. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but you can avoid some of that by, you, by not using your, the email address that you use for your personal correspondence and so on. You can create a free Gmail account or a Yahoo account or whatever specifically for use with Canvas that you don't use for anything else. And then yes, yeah, your students, I did. Can, mm -hmm. the, the students could send inappropriate messages to that, but they could send that to the Canvas inbox as well. Then you and you, you would have records uh, you in, a, in either case, you would have a record if there needed to be a, an intervention of some sort. But um, yeah, I like to, to use, I, I just don't worry about it. I just use that Yahoo account for everything. But um, the I can see why it might be desirable to make a, uh, a, a free email account that was used only for that purpose and was not used for personal um, yeah. communication, which it sounds like you've done. So there, there's relatively little downside to that. Have you heard of That's, any issues, David, Dave, with um, what what the other teacher was talking about. I haven't really heard of anything like that. Uh, well, yes, I've, I've known people to be harassed through Canada, through the learning management system, yes. Usually oh, it's wow. student on, it's, it's more, student on student is more common. Yeah. Oh. Uh, than um, student on teacher, but it has happened. It's rare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happened. Uh, but uh, if you're using, if you're not using that, email account for anything else it's you know functionally it's not that much different than your canvas oh i have a question on yeah. that yeah if you have every all the students put their email in the chat box isn't that available to all the other students yes i wouldn't do that with students okay all right so should they always make it private to you so you have a tech i was trying to think what is the best way to do attendance that's that's an option but the it, it would then not be available in the public chat log. Okay. And and I don't care, you know, whether you send it to me directly when I'm getting a roster. If you send it to me directly or to everyone, I don't care. All right. So but, I um, but these these chat logs are only available to the people who attended the meeting. So you already know, but but certainly if you're more comfortable, send it as a personal message and it won't show up in the public chat log. Okay. I would not have students put their personal emails into the chat tool. Okay. But because of purpose. okay, so just have them log in with their name is the best way to do it. Because that, that's, that's the only thing I can figure out for them to give attendance. And they still forget. 
I mean, oh, yeah. I, it, I it's not perfect. Uh, the only other alternative is to force them to register for the meeting in advance. And that throws another hurdle in their way to getting into the meeting, which I don't like to do. So I'm willing to accept an imperfect attendance log in order to avoid that discouragement. <laughs> you know, I don't want to put anything in the way of people accessing my meetings. But um, the, uh, yeah, if they just put their names in, you can certainly use that for attendance in a Canvas course mm -hmm. where, you know, there's no ambiguity about, uh, ambiguity about who is who. But in my case, where I'm dealing with a potential population of thousands of faculty members, if somebody puts in Hector Rodriguez, there are probably four <laughs> Hector Rodriguez. <laughs> you know, I don't know who yeah. Hector it is. And uh, the Rodriguez is the number one name in Canvas, <laughs> in the Canvas <laughs> user list. So, uh, the um, it uh, it's and there's ambiguity. If I have the email address and the name, I know exactly who is there, and I can communicate uh, in case there's a question later on. Something gets unresolved in the meeting or something. I can. It makes it easier to communicate. But for students, I would definitely not ask them to uh, uh, put their email addresses in on a Zoom meeting. And they might not even want to use their real names when they connect. They can rename what appears in their little video box when they pop up on the screen in Zoom, and they could use an alias or something like that. If somebody was in a stalking type situation or something and had had problems with that, I can relate to that. My wife's had that issue. Uh, you might not want to put your, your real name in there either, because that does get recorded. What about the, just having printing out your roster and check like for the Zoom thing? I mean, I don't have that many people in my Zoom class. Maybe. You can certainly do that. Yeah. So I, I know who visited. I mean, you came to Zoom. Right. So yeah, you can keep a paper checklist, certainly. Well, that takes time, too. Someone said something yeah, about... It's, it's, it's all a trade-off. <laughs> Someone said that a waiting room also gives a list, but I don't know how that's done. Uh, the waiting room is another tool that you can use to control and record who is uh, coming into your Zoom meeting. But it, it's another one of those things that adds another step to getting into the meeting. And I, I and, need to get right to the class. You don't want to waste right. time. And not only that, but you have to let those people in. Yeah. And you can do it en masse, but if somebody comes in a little late, you're forever going back to the waiting room to let new people in, oh. which is distracting and interrupts the session. And sometimes you just miss that. And somebody may sit in the waiting room the whole, you know, and not be able to get in. So I, the main f function of the waiting room with Zoom is to prevent Zoom bombing. Mm -hmm. where someone comes into your Zoom meeting and disrupts it. <coughs> and so you can only let people in that you recognize. But with in my circumstance where I, I never know who's going to show up, mm -hmm. and I may have people who I've never met before coming in, it just doesn't work for me at all. Mm -hmm. There are other ways to deal with Zoom bombing reactively. If somebody starts acting up in your Zoom meeting, you can throw them out very quickly. All right, so the best and they way can't to get back in. So oh, I know what I was going to say. Yes. All right. Can you just click on um, the little icon that says participants and then just take a screenshot? Yeah. Because everybody that's in your class is going to be listed on that. If you click yeah, on it, the little icon that says participants, you can do that. That's a very good idea. Uh, the list can run to more than one screen. So if you have a, lot, a big meeting, you might have to take a couple of screenshots, but yes, that's certainly a, and, and that tends to change over time too. People um, come in and out. Yeah. So it's not a static yeah. thing, but it's certainly a way to get a rough, you know, if you go wait until you're about 10 minutes in and most people have joined and few have left, right. you can take a screenshot of that participants window and, um, and have a pretty good list as well. 
or have them do an activity and then you go do a screenshot. I, I'm, I like, I'm liking that idea. <laughs> it's a thought. It's an idea. Discreetly get the screenshot, especially if I use snippet. Yeah. yeah. I had a question going back to the tripod, which yeah. is that, say I have, a, using it as a document camera, I right. download Zoom onto my phone so that yeah. while I'm on the computer Zoom meeting, I have Zoom on my, um, how does that work? I have Zoom on my phone, so how are they yeah. seeing it? Yeah, you can do that. Um, and again, I wish I could demonstrate this. Uh, oh, so I can tell you. But I the um, for a while. Yeah, all you have to do is start the meeting on your computer, have everything up and running, and then take your phone. You do need to down on the phone. You do need to download the Zoom app in right. advance, and that's free. You just download that and tap on the Zoom app, and then you have a um, a Zoom meeting ID. Okay. right there you just type that uh, on the phone there's a button that says join a meeting and okay. you bring up the zoom app and you tap on that and you enter this meeting id and okay. if there's a password that will show up as well and you if you have to you enter the password and then the phone joins the meeting as another attendee yeah so you're right. you're in the meeting twice once on your computer once on your phone the only thing you have to be careful about when doing that with two devices in the same meeting in the same room is to make sure that one of them has the audio completely muted on it. Otherwise, you can get a feedback loop set up between the two of them and that can howl and it can actually damage your hearing. Uh, it can get loud enough. So on the phone, typically what you do, if you're just using the phone as a document camera, you don't need to be using the microphone and the speaker on the phone, so you mute those, and then everything's fine. And it works like a shot, and the phone camera is actually better than the document camera, to tell you the truth, in terms of, of uh, quality of the image, and it just works like a shot. I was I just playing with it before you all came in today, and I was able to get, um, actually get a better document camera image off my phone using this tri using this holder than I was, I may start doing that instead of using the, um, um, uh, instead of using the document camera to tell you the truth. It's, it's Yeah, because it was really very nice. clear. When, when you showed us the children's book, it was very clear. Well, that was the document camera though. Oh, it's it good. <laughs> it's good too. I, I can never do phone yep. to record right side up. I could never get my phone to show the picture right side up. It was always upside down. Hmm. And I, um, I, I have to be in the front to do the painting. Well, so if you, if you look at what I, let me, uh, let's see, let me show you this. The way I've got this set here yeah. with the tripod in front right. and the phone, that then everything's right side up. And I've got it, and this 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 thing, you, it's a little hard to see, but this thing is offset. You yeah, maybe the tripod would be better, because I never had yeah. the tripod. And that worked like a charm. And I was able to get in here and, and uh, you know, and, and write and so on. Right. And show the book without, get, without the tripod getting in the way. Oh, all right. Yeah, I didn't have so a that's, tripod. That's probably why. Yeah, that that you're right. It it didn't work well. Right. Uh, yeah, you have to have some equi rough equivalent of this tripod. There are some do-it-yourself things you can do, like um, let me see. We had a an image in our uh, uh, where did I put that? This thing, yeah. <laughs> you know, where we jury rig something up. 
Right. But I got to tell you, this this little tripod works so much better than that. Um, and it's much more secure. I was always worried about the phone flipping out from under here and things like that. Uh, this this thing holds it very securely. And it's, um, I, I'm, as I say, I'm thinking about uh, using that in lieu of my document camera now, even though I've got two of those document cameras laying around somewhere. I like this. Um, also, it'll come in handy for other things as well, so. All right, well, I'm leaving you. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see you, Arda. Take care, and you too, Kathy. All right, well, I have a question on something. I want to share my screen with a question on a best way. Oh, I love her Go painting. right ahead. <laughs> She's an art teacher. That's beautiful. All right, so let me share my screen. Let me go to... All right, so when my students log in, um, I have them go to my personal Zoom room here, but cool. some, so some students, I always say, you know, look under the smiley face. I have a different smiley face for each class to help me. <laughs> so this is an 8 a.m. class, so they have the, more, the one with the coffee. But, and then if they can't do that, I say go to the, you know, copy and right. paste. There's the actual URL, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but there are still some students who couldn't log in, so I had to send them a, let me, hmm. I don't know if I, if I can find it. Uh, in fact, I even have you listed as Dave's Zoom meeting room, just save my, my, <laughs> no, no, I'm trying to find it. I have, and well, like, it looks like you've covered your bases there. I can't imagine why anybody would not be able to get in one of those ways. Okay, no, that's your Zoom invite. But I had a more detailed instruction, which most students were able to get to. And But because my desktop is, I had it cleaner when I was teaching a class, I swear. But I hear you. I, no, I understand. But you've really covered the bases there because your that hyperlink has got that same URL in it. Oh, but it was so helpful when you said get rid of the the password because some students were saying password even though I said they didn't need one but I had to delete it from the the yeah. uh, sign in so that was very helpful because that because even though I said you didn't need one it still was showing up oh gosh I wanted to show it very quickly yeah. uh James calendar uh see to me the minute I get it messy then you can have a very detailed list saying where everything well, is take care okay See you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you very I'll much. I'll be there. <laughs> you take care. Have a good evening. Bye, uh, Kathy. Oh, okay. Well, then maybe I do have time. If, if uh, I, oh. oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. I didn't want to take you know, too much time. Oh, no, no, not to worry. Not to worry. All right. So let me just look carefully. It should have my name. Okay. I'll just go to my... It's saved on the desktop. See, when it's, when it's clear... Yeah, the whole thing about being stalked, I mean, I'm so glad that when I was stalked, oh, here it is. It was before you had a lot of this technology. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Can you see this now? I'm still seeing your uh, opening page in your course. All right. So that means I have to leave it open. You're, are you seeing the desktop? Right. All right, and but when I open that screen, you did not see the screen that had a list. Did you share your desktop or did you share the application? It was the, you know what? I think because I originally shared, let me just go back. Stop just here. Drop, drop the scare, share and now share your desktop. Yeah. And that way, if you bring up a new window, I'll see it. Okay. Now that's a common issue in Zoom. That's why I, I try to always ask people, there we go. Okay, now you can see it. So this is a more detailed list. And I said right. I have my own room, so I do not have to spend hours creating, because originally I had to create six different rooms, because I used a Confer Zoom yeah. that originally. Right. Yeah. And I don't have a regular meeting. So, but next semester I will have a regular meeting, but I think the personal one would be best. 
Because that way students that's, can. That's all I use. Okay, and, and I noticed what you did and also what, what Katie does. All right, so I said, uh, well, this is the different time periods, and I wrote Zoom instructions, choose one. I said, click, you know, the one that has my name under the smiley face, and then if you see the gray, because I, I noticed that there's yeah. like a gray and tan, because like if you have a really slow computer, and I do have an older computer, and it was kept showing that Q, and then I gave him choice too. So, but is there, should I put this on the homepage too, or should I send this to them or leave it in the home? I'm saying that, because I kept having to mail it to some certain students each time, but I'm trying to think of a better way to do that. Uh, but you've provided them with the link. If they just click on the link, it's going to work. Except for some students. It, some it for some reason still didn't but when i gave them the different choices I suspect the problem was somewhere later in the process of joining the zoom room and the okay. student just didn't understand that they had to okay you know it does pop up and ask them to open the zoom uh, open zoom client and things like that and they're probably just not doing that that's what i thought so that's why i did choice three where i said you log into conference zoom and then you'll see this where it says click here because I think some students were joining without the video and they're just clicking something right. that where it says you must purchase something from Microsoft. You don't need that. Just join anyway. So I had to put in a little picture and for some that word. Well, you certainly can't. Uh, you certainly want to give them more information, but too much information can be confusing yeah, for others right. as well. Uh, what you had there was really, uh, I think you had an instruction to take, to copy that URL and paste it into the yeah, and that was uh, web browser time. and press enter. Those two together are going to handle the vast majority of cases and anything that they're, any problems they're having, I think have to be after that point, which they're going to run into no matter what instructions you give them. Right. But, but like, you no, know, whatever, on the other hand, if providing more instructions has worked. For a small, for the one or two. Yeah, I mean, go ahead. You obviously do what works. But what you had on that, on the, on your opening page of your course really covers all the options. I mean, either they click on that link or they copy and paste that, that URL into a web browser. Some people are going to have trouble no matter what you do because they're, they're, they've got an equipment problem or they just don't get the basic idea. And okay. it, it, you know, you may not be able to solve all those problems. And like you said, too much information sometimes overwhelms some students because I had exactly. is a module, but if it was they just, have that six step process, they may just, decide not to try it because it's too, like, it seems too complicated. What I would recommend in the circumstance, what I always like to do with Zoom, if I'm going to be dealing with the same client cohort over and over and over again, is the first Zoom meeting I have is for no other purpose than to get everybody into Zoom. Okay. And I just, this is our only expectation today is that you, we will ascertain, we will get you into Zoom. And if you have, you know, a, if everybody, if it works for everybody, eventually fine. If not, then, you know, identifying individual folks and setting up a one-on-one -on -one communication with them, starting with email and then going through Zoom and working through, because some people are going to have problems that you just can't imagine anybody would have. And you'll find out that in a, in the one-on-one -on -one communication process and get them to the point where they can reliably access the Zoom meetings because that's so critical. Right now, it's the only way we have to, to really communicate with them. All right, so, more, so, so stick with the original and then save that for those individual students or maybe save it in- yeah, I would, if, if an individual student has a problem, I deal with it individually. Because okay. it looks like for the vast majority of your students, what you already have there is yeah. perfect. 
And I always feel right. subjecting everyone to extra information that they don't need. All right. Well, thanks, Dave. See, is there a class tomorrow? Yeah. Uh, two. I don't know why. We, when we were scheduling these things, we had to do it in a hurry because of a deadline. <laughs> and I, I somehow ended up with a meeting on Friday afternoon. I apologize. I know everybody has better things to do with their Friday afternoon. I've said some of them over and over again, but I always learn something new. And sometimes I stay afterwards to hear what other people's questions are because it helps. That's you know, usually the best part of the session, to tell you the truth. <laughs> like the whole tripod thing. The, in fact, it's amazing yeah. that that web cameras are so expensive now. I had to take a, a traffic school and they gave me one free. Really? Yeah. My God, I wonder where they got them. <laughs> Years ago though, I mean, there was like, and that those- Oh, okay, were, yeah, right. Yeah, they were like 10 or $15 at that time. So I think it was part of like, I think you paid, whatever you paid for traffic school. And I think it was part of the 10 or 15, it cost like 10 or $15. Right. So yeah. it came along with the, the purchase. Is that the I one you're using now? <laughs> what? Oh, no, Are I'm using, still using on my that one. I, I still have it somewhere, but I think it's, I think this is, this is how long ago I was, I think it's when I was still in with my parents, so. <laughs> yeah, those, yeah. those tend to not last too long, <laughs> but yeah, I can remember $10 webcam. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks a lot. I'll look forward to it. All right. Bye. Take care, Kathy. Bye-bye.